Excellent, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, good afternoon everyone, uh, I'm Tom Safford, I'm a lecturer in psychology and cognitive science. That's my passion uh, and my day job, lucky me. Um, who here has committed a research blog, they have blogged about research, there's other people, about five or six hands. Who has consumed research blogging, read blogs on research? Maybe twice as many. Okay, I'm here to tell you about research blogging for fun and profit, and I'm going to tell you that um, it's a great thing for academics to do, it's both enjoyable, and it's also uh, has many, many potential benefits. And I'm going to try and talk you through uh, examples of research blogging I've done, and show you some of the, the hows and whys and wherefores, and hopefully we'll end up, I'll try and finish a bit early, we'll end up somewhere where you're a bit clearer on what, what that means, for research blogging. But um, this, is, this is the context, this is the background for what I'm going to say. Um, there's an idea uh, of the lonely academic, they, they labour in secret on precious research artefacts and then they come blinking into the light to bring that knowledge to the world, they quickly stuff it in an academic journal where one or zero people read it. Um, and that's how scholarship happens. And that is of course not true. Scholarship has always been an invisible college, a community of people engaged in a conversation arguments, refutations, provocations, gossip, scandal. And it used to happen offline, in the conferences. There used to be that invisible college which uh, you had to turn up to be part of. But because of the digital disruption, the same digital disruption that's changing scholarly publishing, more and more of that disciplinary um, conversation is happening online. And this is tremendous, okay? It's tremendous for um, the access to the information uh, of the publics that can consume scholarly work is tremendous for the individual scholars who can now be part of this riotous, ongoing, multidisciplinary conversation. So here's my friend Dougald. He said about Twitter, which some people think of as kind of microblogging, um, it's like having a bit of you that's always down the pub. Okay? You can always be having an interesting chat with your, your, your scholarly mates. I say it's like having a bit of you that's always at the conference bar. Okay? Now you can see why that's so tremendously liberatory, because we can't always afford to go to that conference. You don't have the funding, you don't have the time, you've got to stay home and look after someone. But with things like online conversation, with blogging, forums, Twitter, you can join in with the people who are deciding the future of your discipline. So it's tremendously exciting, but it's also liberatory because it opens up the conversation to people who, you know, didn't have the geographical or financial privilege to be in the right location for that scholarly conversation. So it's a good thing. Good thing. Capital T, capital T. Um, so I faced a choice here with my talk about research blogging. I, um, uh, was, I was stuck between narcissism uh, uh, an abstraction. Now, I didn't want to be too abstract. I didn't want to talk about research blogging without saying what it was. So I've decided to talk about what I've done in research blogging. So you will have to excuse that this is extremely self-centered, but I, it does have the benefit that um, it's some different examples of kinds of research blogging, and because it's the stuff I've done, I know it well. Uh, so that's the motivation. It's not just rampant egotism. Uh, it's not just um, so I, I, I've discovered, reviewing the slides for this talk, that I actually have uh, more than one research blog. Uh, I don't know, and I'm going to talk about how that happened. So, um, in 2004, I wrote a book. It was called Mind Hacks. Um, and in 2004, there weren't many research blogs. There weren't many psychology blogs. There were one or two people blogging. And um, blogging, indeed, was cool. It was fashionable. It was exciting. It's no longer fashionable or exciting. The Vice Chancellor has a blog. The Pope has a blog. The technology is there, but there is no real technical barrier to putting stuff online. It's not interesting anymore. We could all be, some of you are probably doing it right now on your phones. So with the, the, uh, the accessibility of putting stuff out there, everyone is a blogger now. But um, we started this blog to go with a book, which is a popular science uh, book, and we started a thing called a group blog, which is where you have many contributors. Um, and over the, and this has been running for 10 years now, uh, just won a scientific American uh, blog award in 2005, in 2016, it won the British Psychological Society Public Engagement Award, uh, it was called by Ben Goldacre, um, the best source for psychology uh, information anywhere, not just on the net. 
Most of this is written by other people, not by me. I'm proud to be part of it. We've written two million words. There's only like 5,000 posters. Um, and this is uh, a good place to start if you want a research blog. We don't talk about our own research mostly. We curate. So we mostly point short articles, two, three, four hundred words, point to something that's happened and say, oh look, this is interesting. It's like a DJ model of science communication. Here's a new paper. Here's an exhibition that's happening. There was some TV last night that was on this topic and psychology is relevant. Um, uh, or occasionally we had commentary, you know. So it's like, here's an interesting thing and this is what I think. Good way to get started. Um, it's all published under a Creative Commons license. It's free for use and reuse. Um, and here are our top 10 uh, posts. Uh, uh, the statistic, we reset the statistics to the back end program. But uh, these are the most popular in the last four years. Um, so there's, what have we got? We've got, um, do blind people hallucinate on LSD? How to test your synesthesia? Um, why changing diet might allow you to see infrared? Maybe what you would expect from popular psychology. Um, so these are all uh, popular descriptions of research nuggets or findings. It's brilliant practice for communicating clearly, communicating research clearly. Whatever you do as a scholar, that's going to be more and more relevant. So anyone who's not a specialist like you, specialists in neighbouring disciplines are the public. So you need to have that skill, whether you're you know, trying to go to the UN and talk to stakeholders in your research, or whether you're writing a grant to get funded. So this is a great way of practicing talking about research. Um, and you find out fun things about the discipline. And it leads interesting places. People get in touch with you. So Vaughan Bell, who writes most of this site, was flown from South America to the Houses of Parliament to testify in front of the Select Committee because of a series of blog posts that he wrote about the effects of media on children's development. Okay, so, because it's out there, if you, if you write and you keep up writing, you write interesting things, people end up noticing. Um, when I got my job here, I uh, started another blog, uh, a different place. Uh, so I've got my own staff page here. It, uh, it's like staff pages, with it's got a list of my publications, but the heart of it is a blog. And what I do is when something happens in my scholarly life, something, um, yeah, something notable, I uh, create a, a short 400 words uh, about that. So here's me saying what a grant I got was about. Um, here's one talking about a paper I had published a couple of years ago that I was excited about. And so what this does is it's a, a lay summary to the research or the research activity to bring people in. So there's a marker somewhere open, even if the paper isn't open, there's a marker somewhere on the internet where people can find out what it is that I do. So it's kind of uh, entirely instrumental and selfish. I just want to raise the profile of the work that I do. Um, that's another, another way of you might use blogging. Uh, we, got, uh, we got another grant, me and a colleague at Nottingham. We started a project blog, um, which is similar. I guess I use this blog. Um, I think of this as kind of creating a marker um, of the activity we do. So what we might have done is got the, the, the research money, and we might have hired the postdoc and just done the experiments and tried to write the papers. They're not out yet. We're two and a half years into the grant. So we've been doing a lot. But does anyone know? Well, maybe they wouldn't, but now we kind of have uh, an ongoing discussion where we talk about our project activities, we share uh, ideas, we kind of have sort of semi, yeah, semi-formal to and fro's about the ideas that are at play in our grant. So it gives evidence that we're part of a project that's engaged in a piece of work, and it means we're discoverable. So it's kind of like plant planting a, a flag on some intellectual territory. Um, so even if, yeah, so it gives, you, it gives you something to point people to, to show that you've, you've not just been sitting in your office twiddling your thumbs for, thumbs for a few years. Uh, so that's another use of blogs. What else do I do? Um, so what I've said so far has been a kind of broadcast model of blogging. Um, but the great thing about internet forums is you get the to and fro. So you discover um, people who comment on your blog, or you read other people's blogs, you get to see uh, what people think of what you write, and that's the, where the real pleasure is. And there's a few uh, 
uh, platforms that enable uh, really easy publishing and have kind of uh, easy and mechanisms for people to find your work and send you feedback. So one is Medium, which you've probably all read things on. Um, I use this, this is a little teaching thought I had. So you know, how do you start discussions with large lectures of people? Something I'm displaying none of those techniques today because I'm just talking to you. But maybe we'll get there, maybe in, in the questions. Um, and so this is really one of the, this is, as well as uh, something that's great to share with colleagues and hear back from people who've said, I do this, this is how I approach my teaching, this is how I try and start discussions. Just have like pub chat, but basically professional pub chat of the internet. Um, this is thinking aloud. This is me just trying to practice putting my thoughts in a coherent form to see if I agree with myself, to see if anyone else agrees with me. And that's one of the, that's one of the great benefits of blogging. And how it differs, why it's the conference bar, not the conference. Because it's pretty disposable as a format, blogging. So it's, um, it's, you, you, um, you shouldn't be a perfectionist. You want to write this thing and um, not be afraid to have a few rough edges, to have a few hesitant thoughts. You don't have to have a fully formed output because you're only writing, you know, this is, this is 1,500 words, you know, you might write 200 words for a blog post. You're in that kind of, you know, half a thought, half a scholarly thought. Um, another place if you want to, so that's a great place to start if, you do, uh, if you're interested in research blogging. Another absolutely great place if you want to blog about your own research, other people's uh, research, is The Conversation, which is a news website part funded by this university uh, where you work with professional journalists. Um, lots of PhD students in my department have had um, uh, have published on this site uh, where they've just uh, published sh uh, short commentaries or reviews, uh, or sort of almost little mini research summaries of different areas. Uh, you know, what do we know about children and creativity? What do we know about creativity and sleep? You know, something like that. Uh, one of them, uh, Dan Dennis, uh, posted to this last year, and he had 700,000 people read his research. His, his, his piece, which is sort of 900 words on this website. Okay? That's a lot of eyeballs. Right? What a tremendous achievement. You get to work with professional journalists who will edit your work. It doesn't go out till you've approved it. So if you're not confident about that kind of writing for the public, whatever stage of your research career you're in, this is, a, this is an absolutely uh, great vehicle. You can just use it as an excuse to get practice at uh, writing about research for the public. Uh, and that's something I read recently, because everyone was talking about stats and bringing their stats tests home and saying, well, this is their children's stats tests home and saying, oh, I got a question wrong, how can it be a good test? Uh, and that's the answer, if you, in case you wonder. Um, uh, and then there's Twitter, of course, which are, who's on Twitter? Did we, did we have that question already? Most people are on Twitter, of course, you're all network 21st century scholars, love it. I wrote a paper about Twitter, how meta is that? Um, uh, and that says many of the things I've said to you today about um, how useful it is as, uh, as a method of um, finding out information but also interacting with your peers. And I think the, real, the way to think about blogging and Twitter as a researcher is that you don't want to follow the model of getting as many followers as possible. And you don't want to be just tweeting pictures of cute cats and telling people what you had for lunch. You want to be finding your audience. If you only have 30 followers on Twitter, but they're the 30 people who form the core of your research community, you are using it successfully as a researcher. Um, I'm going to skip this, but this is basically, I just took a few screenshots of Twitter and seeing, you know, here's a, here's a lecturer in York and a professor in Oxford. One of them heard something on the news and says, can this be true? And the professor in Oxford says, no, we need to think about this. The back and forth that is going on all the time on Twitter among scholarly researchers is just so inspiring. Um, but you're all on Twitter, so you probably know that. But it's, uh, if you weren't, you should check it out. Uh, here's some more dissection. This is a paper that was out a few years ago. This was on the BBC News on uh, the Today programme in the morning. You know, within 40 minutes, it had been destroyed by people I follow, psychologists on Twitter. They were pulling out the, the stats from the tables and showing how they couldn't, the stats reported in the paper couldn't be correct. Um, the paper being, you know, with the, 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 
there was a big brouhaha. It was fantastic to watch it happening in real time. So, the big benefits, you get to practice writing for those publics. You get to promote the work, you get to hear back from different people um, uh, who, what they think of your work, you get networking, as well as those other things I mentioned. You create markers for projects, you can ask for help, um, you can find collaborators, you can get gigs, work. Uh, so, yeah, research blogging for fun and profit. Um, I think that's the final slide. That's the thing in nature which says, how do scientists use social media? So the biggest one is to post work, but these four big ones are um, discovering your peers, finding recommended papers, following discussions, not even commenting on discussions, following discussions. So, uh, you know, lots of scientists are using it for the reasons I said, to be part of this rolling, porous, riotous, scholarly conversation. Um, and I hope by showing that there are lots of different formats of blogging and different ways you could use blogging, lots of different benefits. So there's no magic to this. There's not even a high technical bar anymore. It's very easy to just push something to the internet. You can just get started. There's not a secret way to doing it. You just have to know what you want to say and maybe in the process find out who you want to say it to and why you want to say it. So I'm going to stop a few minutes early. If there are any questions about the world of blogging, and research problem. There was a guy at the back first. Thanks, hi. I'm um, just wondering how much time you spend doing this on a weekly basis, and also how long, so if you publish an article, for example, on the conversation, how long you'll follow that for and continue responding to comments on that? Okay. It depends a lot on why I'm blogging and uh, what for. So the conversation, um, I, would I would always respond to comments whenever they came because it's, it's on the internet, it's got my name on it. If people are not being insulting or they make good points, I, I want to engage with them, so I, uh, you know, I follow up. Probably, your problem with most people, it's not like an internet forum where you have to be responding to crazies you know, for the rest of your life. The, 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 comment, the quality of comments is very good on the conversation, um, which is maybe why I invest in answering them. How much time do I spend? It varies. I spent 25 minutes writing a blog post this morning about a small thought. That was fun, but uh, I haven't. I did almost nothing between October and December because I was teaching. So you know you can fit it around. Obviously, the more you do it, the more people you build up head of steam. The easier it gets, and the more people notice what you do. That was my question too. <laughs> yeah. So it varies is the answer. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. It was really stimulating. Well, thank you. Of my of <laughs> in terms of well, okay, before you say don't be ashamed, because yeah. actually, I think it is entirely optional for us. For, there's an idea, just because it's new or newish, that we should be making every early career researcher be doing public engagement. Um, I think it's really optional. Most people don't. And maybe most people, it wouldn't suit them. They, that's not how they at work or think. So it is, it's great fun. Fit, you know, I'm, I'm offering, I'm showing you the carrot, but don't, any, don't, don't do it because you feel you ought to. Anyway, well, what was your question? Um, the question is, one of the things that you mentioned was to do with, because um, <coughs> the examples that you gave, especially around mind hacks and so on, sound like such an authoritative site and source that's been pulled together there. So my question was really broadly around, you made a comment about here, here people are deciding the future of your discipline. Right. Uh, do you think that applies across the range of disciplines? Because I'm just thinking if you're not in that conversation as an academic, as a researcher, yeah. where do you think that puts you? Do you mean if you're not online, are you... Well, I think it is still optional. I think there's, there's, there's different, I see different sub-disciplines. I know psychology most of all. But in, within psychology, there are some disciplines which are very heavily networked, and you see a lot of evidence of the, the, the way those particular journals or topics are changing expresses the opinions you hear people on Twitter expressing. And there are other disciplines where it seems like they're, they're not as well networked, and so there, there's obviously conversations still going on at the conference bar. The conference bar will always be there, <coughs> but it's not as accessible to everyone. So it's, um, yeah. So it's still, I think it's still, it's still optional. It is, yeah. To answer the question, yeah. I don't know. Um, 
So I started a blog two weeks ago after a discussion with my supervisor. And my first thought was, isn't this what people did in 1990? Yeah, it's not so cool my, anymore. My thought now is, I mean, obviously, I mean, is it still quite common? Or would Twitter be the new blogging and should I give up on the blog? Well, it depends why you're blogging, <laughs> doesn't that? So, I mean, the good thing about blogging is that you create something that's got a bit more gravitas than a 140 character tweet and it will be there as testimony to your intellectual engagement with the discipline um, for the next few years at least till you, know, till you take it down or whatever and so when you know so that's that's good to know. there's lots of value to it to to showing that you're writing and thinking about your topic you can tweet to your blog post as well, can't you? Yeah, they're complementary, I guess. Yeah. yeah.